I kind of was like, I was like I All right, let's, uh, let's get started. So question 16, question 16, why was it necessary that the mediator be both truly God and truly man? And for that, uh, we go to the catechisms. Question number 16 asks the question directly, why was it requisite that the mediator should be God? It was requisite that the mediator should be God that he might sustain and keep the human nature from sinking under the infinite wrath of God and the power of death. Notice what's at risk is the human nature under the power of death. Give worth and efficacy to his suffering. So because of the union of the human and the divine, the death of the God-man is of infinite value. Um, um, worth and efficacy to his sufferings, obedience and intercession, and to satisfy divine justice, procure his favor, purchase a peculiar people, give his spirit to them, conquer all their enemies, and bring them to everlasting salvation. So then what, why was it requis requisite the meteor should be man? It, it, it was requisite that the mediator should be man, that he might advance our nature, perform obedience to the law, suffer and make intercession for us in our nature, have a fellow feeling of our infirmities, that we might uh, receive the adoption of sons and have comfort and access with boldness under the throne of grace. So this, this uh, is justified in what we just got through reading. He had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he, he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. Um, uh, for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. Uh, s similarly, Hebrews 4, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. So that's the key insight, sympathize. But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So therefore, with confidence, we draw near the throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Yes? Uh, going back to, the, to question 38 uh, that you just had, uh, when it talked about the, the power of God sustaining uh, the, the human nature, keeping it from sinking, why is, why is that different than like the other, like Lazarus, for example, where we see the divine power through Christ raising him from the dead, but like, why couldn't it just be God resurrecting the human nature from the dead? Like what, I don't know why, I don't, I don't understand why that distinct like why that distinction is important that like the divine power the, the divine power of Christ saving Christ from death as opposed to just divine power in general or I don't know if it is an important distinction um, I, I think that that um, from the human nature from sinking I think he's talking there the complete obliteration if, if Christ were only man to receive the wrath of God due to humanity's sins from the beginning of time would have been completely obliterated. So it's more about bearing the wrath than it is just death. Yeah, okay. the whole dissolution of the, of the is, he'd been vaporized if it were not for the divine nature sustaining the human under the whole weight of the wrath of God against the sins of the whole world. I think that's what's in view here. Without, without the, so, so if there's no divine nature then even if one man, even if there were one perfect man, but he were not divine, let's just say a human, uh, fully human but not divine man uh, suffered on the cross, he, he, um, he, he, his, he could not die for the sins of the whole world because he's finite. So he could, what, could he die for the sins of one other person, but uh, one to one? Jesus is claimed, Jesus is claimed to be God is vindicated by the resurrection. Mm -hmm. he, he couldn't, 
power of death couldn't hold. Romans 1, 4, declared to be the Son of God with power through the resurrection. So it's just another example of how salvation is, is of the Lord, as Jonah said. It's all, it's all, it's all on the Lord. And he, he couldn't do it unless he was God. Yes, and then, and then the, other, the other part of this, uh, the, the emphasis of in, in, in our nature, you know, to keep the human nature, uh, suffering in our nature, um, You know, the medieval theologians, uh, are, you know, argued about whether or not a donkey could have been crucified for the sins of the world. And not only is that a finite sacrifice, but the other thing is that a donkey doesn't share nature, uh, a nature with us. It do doesn't share human nature. So there's a sense in which to atone for human sins, the sacrifice has to be human. It has to be a man to satisfy justice on behalf of the sins of humanity. It would have to be as much man as Adam to be the second Adam. Yes. Right. Yes. So the undoing of Adam's transgression involves a man, a savior man, but it can't be a finite man. It has to be an infinite man. <coughs> and in the, the union of the human and the divine, you get the, you get the infinite man who can then bear humanity's sins um, and bear the infinite weight of the wrath due to those sins while the divinity is upholding and sustaining the, the, his humanity under that weight. So we're in pretty deep water here. Can, can you tell? Uh, uh, enjoy the, the succinctly beautiful description of our Lord Jesus' work as our Redeemer in 8.4, distinguished between his states of humiliation and exaltation, helping you in that respect, the shorter catechism, 27, 28, larger catechisms. Um, here we go. Larger catechism, 46 through 56. So here's, uh, here's how paragraph 4 starts. The office the Lord Jesus did will most willingly undertake that he might dis which, he, which, which that he might discharge. He was made under the law. So here we have the description of his humiliation. He was made under the law and did perfectly fulfill it. Endured most grievous torments immediately in his soul and most painful sufferings in his body. Was crucified and died, was buried and remained under the power of death yet saw no corruption. That's humiliation. Exaltation. On the third day, he rose from the dead with the same body in which he suffered, with which also he ascended into heaven, and there sitteth the right hand of his Father, making intercession, and shall return to judge men and angels at the end of the world. Uh, so I, I think, again, I think, I think that the, you know, the, the Westminster theologians have helped us to, get, to give us categories with which to understand the fullness of the work of Christ. There, there is the work of, that uh, we can categorize under his humiliation from his birth uh, to his death, and then his exaltation from his resurrection to his return. Okay, question number 18. Notice the verb tenses. In 8.5, did the Lord Jesus do what he came to do? So question five, the Lord Jesus, by his perfect obedience and sacrifice of himself, which he, through the eternal spirit, once offered up to, unto God, hath fully satisfied the justice of his Father and purchased not only reconciliation but an everlasting inheritance in the kingdom of heaven for all those whom the Father hath given unto him. Uh, so the, the, the verb tenses, they're all past tense. In other words, the, the confession, the, the view of the confession is that a transaction has taken place at the cross. Um, not just a potential redemption but actual redemption. Redemption was accomplished. A transaction took place. He who knew no sin became our sin, that we might receive the righteousness of God in him. Um, so the, 
you know, um, John Murray's book, Redemption Accomplished and Applied, I, I think the title itself is a very helpful one. Redemption accomplished. It was accomplished. Your salvation was accomplished. It was infallibly accomplished. It was accomplished with certainty. It, 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 it uh, then awaited ap um, application, but it was a done deal. It was accomplished. And so that, that's the meaning behind uh, the verb tenses. Well, we see the same thing in Romans 8. Those he foreknew, he predestined, he predestined, called, justified, glorified, all of those in the past tense. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, even glorified is in the past tense for people not yet born. Yeah, I think it's even a perfect tense, which means something that's happened in the past that the, the, um, the, the, the benefit of which extends uh, indefinitely into the future. Did you have a question, Matthew? No, I'm just, I, I love the fact that uh, two issues of, of our, our reform soteriology are dealt with uh, at the end of five. Eight, five. Uh, he purchased not only reconciliation, but an everlasting inheritance. So there's preservation of the saints. For all those the Father hath given him, there's definite atonement. It's just in that one sentence. No argument, no proof, just here it is. Yes, uh, so this, uh, this leads us into a discussion of the, with questions both um, the answer, the answer that I assume that you've reached with, uh, with question number 18, did he do what he came to do? Well, the verb tenses are saying he did. He, he, uh, accomplished, he accomplished redemption. It, it's, it's a done deal. It's a finished work. Um, he, 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 he accomplished all that he set out to do. Um, but with continuing action, the next paragraph. Um, yes. So there's a, there's a finality to what took place on the cross. Um, um, and I, and I, 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 I think that the, you know, I want to, un want to underscore that, that, that the other views of the atonement have the effect of, of emptying what happens at the cross of its meaning. It becomes a, a, a an, an event that potentially saves rather than an event that saves. Did he actually bear our sins on the cross? So I think I think that that's that's the kind of, of language that we um, that we find here. I can't find one of my overheads. It seems to be a chronic problem up here. But uh, here's some, some of the language that we find. John 7, 37, all that the Father gives to me will come to me. So there, there is, a, there is a, a, moving on to question um, number, number 19, what is the relationship between the extent and efficacy of Christ's atonement? Um, all that the Father gives to me shall come to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will not ca cast out. See, there's a definitive people. There's those whom the Father has given. They, 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 they will. They will come. Uh, there's, a, there, there, there's no possibility of them not coming to him. So that there is a people that the Father has given, and, he, and, and, and redemption will function in such a way that those will come to him, and when they come to him, they, they will not be lost. They are secure. Their salvation is certain. Um, John 10, 15, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for who? For the sheep. Uh, Acts 20, 18, be careful to your, uh, get, uh, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseas, overseers to care for the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. The church of God was purchased. And um, we're going to come back to that verse in a, in a minute in another respect because we have here the, God of, the blood of God. 
So the communicatio idiomata is what we will look at with question number seven. Um, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live, in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So what is the extent of the atonement? Well, there, there, is, a, there is a truth in which you, you either are going to um, compromise the value or the extent of the atonement. So, um, in, in other words, the classic Reformed understanding is that the atonement is designed for a people that Christ goes to the cross and he dies and suffers for them and accomplishes their salvation. And that salvation is secure and made real in time by the Spirit drawing them to Christ in whom they put their faith and they are saved. Uh, so the, 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 the salvation of, of, the, the, of uh, those whom the Father has given, the salvation of the sheep, the salvation of the church of God, the salvation of the apostle Paul, it's, it's particular, it's personal. It's designed for a people. So Paul can say he loved me personally, not just, not, just in, not just that he loved the whole wide world and I'm sort of part of the whole wide world, but no, he, des he loved me at the cross. It's that, uh, it's, it's that particular and, and specific in its design. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.41, for our sakes he made him who knew no, uh, him to be sin who knew no sin. So at the cross, he took on the sin. Whose sin? Our sin, his people's sin, the sin of his sheep, the sin of the church, uh, the, the sin of those whom the Father had given so that we might become the righteousness of God, um, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So this, again, I put the words down here. The actual transaction takes place at the cross. An actual transaction where he takes on our sin and we receive, and, and we receive his righteousness. Uh, Peter, he bore our sins in his body on the tree. He didn't potentially <coughs> Potentiality that only becomes actualized as, as I make it efficacious through my faith. No, he actually bore our sins. Whose sins? Well, he didn't bear the sins of the whole world or the whole world would be saved. He bore the sins of his people, of his sheep, of the church, um, of his own, of his people. So if you're going to say uh, that Christ died for all the people of the world in the same way that he died for his people, you empty the cross of its of its value. And the value only is realized as people actualize it through faith. And so the Reformed have argued the confession presents the idea that no, he act, there, there was a transaction. He took our sins. He paid the penalty. Uh, that then is accomplished in time when we come to repentance and faith and put our trust in Christ. Yes? Uh, two sort of related things. One, do, do you think it's accurate? I've heard this statement to try to summarize that idea of like that the, the cross was sufficient for all but only efficient in who it saved. Mm -hmm. and, and with that, sort of how do we understand language like in First John where it says to forgive sins and not, not for ours only but for the sins of the whole world. Like what, what is kind of the thought process and like how we, how we frame those together? Well, not only for ours, um, not only for this generation, but for every generation, not just for Jews, but for Gentiles. Um, so not, not for a particular group, but for all kinds of people, every nation, tongue, and tribe, so not limited by worldly categories. Um, but did he bear the sins of unrepentant, evil, wicked uh, people? No. If he did, they would be saved. And if he did and they are not saved, then they're being punished unjustly. Because the penalty was paid. The price was paid. So there's a particularity to the atonement rather than a universality. Yes? So how do we consider the efficacy of the atonement? Is it limited to some like extent of the atonement? Or is it efficacious to save all but since it's limited in its extent? It is limited in its extent and therefore efficacious for all those for whom it is designed. 
He goes to the cross for his sheep. Ollie? Yeah, but what Ben was mentioning there about the sufficient, efficient distinction, I think is, is helpful. And the, the assembly would hold to that, that it, it is fully sufficient for all, but it's not efficient, efficient. So it, it's not as if we're, we're putting a, a limit on the merit of Christ's work and his atoning value in that sense. So that, that's what the sufficient, sufficiency is designed to go on, that his sacrifice is infinitely valuable. But then the, we make the distinction with efficiency that it doesn't, it's not designed to save anyone but the elect. Yes. So fully sufficient, but only efficient for the elect. <coughs> yes, and I, um, I think that that's, that is a very helpful distinction, um, sufficient, efficient. It is, no, nobody, uh, you know, I don't know of anybody who is, even historically speaking, is putting a limit on the value of the, could, 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 uh, could the, the death of the, the infinite Lord Jesus Christ pay for all the sins of all the world? Yes, it's, it's, it's of infinite worth. For whom is it efficient? For those for whom, whom it is designed. Those whom God has chosen out of the mass of fallen humanity uh, to save. Uh, the, same, the same language, I think we ran into this in <coughs> chapter, chapter 3. Yeah, chapter 3, um, chapter 3, 6. God hath a. Uh, recall this: God hath appointed the uh, the elect unto glory, so that He, by the eternal, most free purpose of His will, foreordained all the means thereunto. Therefore, they who are elected, being fallen in Adam, are redeemed. Again, the past tense: are redeemed by Christ, are effectually called unto faith by the Spirit working in due season, justified, adopted, sanctified, kept by His power through faith unto salvation. Neither are any other redeemed by Christ, effectually called, justified, adopted, and sanctified, but, and saved, but the elect only. John 17, Jesus said, I do not pray for all, but for those whom the Father has given. Yes, which is another, is another powerful argument, I think, is that there, there is a harmony between the work of redemption and the work of intercession. So Jesus says, I pray not for the world, but for those whom, whom you have given to me in his high priestly prayer. I pray not for the world. He doesn't intercede for them. Um, his, they are not the beneficiaries of his redemption or his intercession. How, how do you feel like this plays out in evangelism where would you like, do you feel comfortable telling someone that Christ died for them if they have not accepted faith? And like, or so I think in a reformed evangelism, we don't say Christ died for them. I think we say Christ died for the sins of the world and you need to repent and believe. I don't think we offer a theory of the atonement or the a theory of the, um, you know, the uh, extent of the atonement. So a lot of um, the evangelism I grew up with hearing was all, Je you know, Jesus died for you. I say Jesus died for sinners. That's more correct to say Jesus died for sinners. Now whether or not he died for you depends on whether or not you have faith and if you have faith then one day you'll walk into, you know, heaven, and it'll, I mean, you, you know that that old uh, analogy that the uh, you walk through the gates of heaven is whosoever wills on the outside, and you walk through, and you turn around, and you look, and you see your name written from the foundation of the world. We don't see the apostles saying, mm -hmm. "Jesus died for you." They say, "Repent." Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's just, let's just briefly go through this. The Ar Jacobus. Arminius, um, dissented from the Calvinistic um, majority in the Dutch church, and he issued his five points of Arminianism. Uh, they were free will. Uh, you have the capacity within yourself to repent and believe God. Um, Slightly qualified, uh, I think some Arminians would say, uh, with, with the help of prevenient grace, but the prevenient grace is universally given. So everybody has, has been given, a, given enough grace 
to empower their will to repent and believe the gospel. As a result of the cross. Mm-hmm. Provenient grace is given as a result of the cross. Okay. Yeah. Uh, second, con- conditional election, condition upon divinely foreseen faith. So the who are the elect? The elect are the people that God foresaw would believe, and then you decide, well, they're going to believe, so I'll choose them. Okay, third, universal atonement. The atonement is for everyone without distinction, which again, as we've seen, there's a problem then for the value. But it sounds so friendly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we sound so mean. We do. But that universal atonement guarantees the salvation of nobody. Yeah, there's a, if, if you uh, know of our little uh, pamphlet, uh, The Five Points of Calvinism, there's a couple of great Spurgeon quotes in there where he's battling with the Arminians. And why, why do you say it guarantees the salvation of nobody? It, if Christ's death did not actually pay the penalty for the sins of certain people, mm-hmm. if the actual transaction did not take place, yeah. there is at least the theoretical possibility that nobody would exercise their free will to believe mm-hmm. and therefore be saved. Which is then seen in point five also. Yeah, yeah. Salvation for critical sins. So they go on and they say uh, grace is resistible. So Jesus says all that the Father has given, given to me shall come to me. Um, we would understand that in a way an Arminian would not. We would say it, you know, the Holy Spirit, the hound of heaven will, will, will trace you down and, and and will bring you to faith. Um, you know, Jesus speaks of draw, drawing, being drawn to the Father. Y- yes. You hear this in the altar calls of the, the revivalists. This may be your last chance mm-hmm. to accept Christ. You, know, you may go out the door and be hit by a car. I heard that growing up all the time. I mean, that was Jonathan Edwards <laughs> in, in his most famous sermon. All right, resistible grace, and then salvation is forfeitable. So you can lose your salvation. Uh, it's the denial of the, of the perseverance of the saints or the preservation of the saints, however you want to say it. Uh, so the, there then was an international Calvinistic um, uh, council that was called that met in Holland and Dort, and it rebutted the five points of Arminianism with uh, what comes to us in English under the acronym of TULIP. Total depravity as opposed to free will. No, you're free. your will is not free. It's in bondage to sin. Um, unconditional election. God didn't choose you because he foresaw some good thing in you. Uh, if he's, that's as high as it goes. What you, you're, you're going through. Tulip. I haven't elaborated it beyond that. I'm just describing the T-U-L-I-P. Um, unconditional election, um, God, did, God did not look forward and see some virtue in you that determines the selection. If you do that, you've undermined the gospel of grace. You're back on merit. There was some value in you. There was some virtue in you that, that sets you apart from everyone else. So that's being denied. T-U-L, limited atonement or particular redemption. Uh, the atonement is uh, designed for the people whom the Father has chosen. Um, uh, resist, uh, ir- irresistible grace, I, irresistible grace, uh, God makes himself irresistible to us so that we come willingly. And salvation is for, 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 for forfeitable, no, uh, the perseverance of the saints. The saints... Uh, the elect, they will persevere in faith. They cannot lose their salvation. As Jesus says in John 10, we are double wrapped in the hands of the Father and of the Son, and no one shall pluck us out of his hands. Yes? How or why did anyone conceive of these things? I mean, was there some type of context that made these people say, oh, no, these are the five things we disagree with? They just seem so... Well, I think this is the default drive for the natural man. I mean, I, I, I think that this is, this would be what the guy on the streets would say, yes, sir. right? They, they don't. They would. Yeah. In other words, I think it takes a very strong Augustinian doctrine of sin for this. To, in other words, if you get point one right, total depravity, ULIP falls into place. Sure, but I mean, I'm saying the list of the Armenian. Points. Yeah. I, mean, I, I think a lot, a lot of it too falls more in line with 
what we experience just based off of our world where like oh like we feel like we have free will we feel like we made a conscious choice we feel like yeah. we like anything can happen we it, feel like we can resist grace all these things it, and so it we goes back to what yeah. you said a number of weeks ago the fundamental question do you start with god and work down or do you start with man and work up if you start with man and work up you get arminianism yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. so is it like it's some type of like enlightenment thinking that sort of made mm-hmm. this branch of people who go out Um, make these five points. I, I think that there's just always been this battle in the Christian church between the Augustinians and the Pelagians and the semi-Pelagians and the Arminians. They, they can go to scripture with all of the all, all verses, uh, whosoever verses the whole world. So they can draw, draw out of scripture things to support their view, but and it is not unreasonable to assume that the commands to repent and believe imply that you have the capacity to do that. Right. There's a difference. I, I think it's a false implication, but you, you're not crazy. So there's a difference between capacity and responsibility, and and so that's another subtlety that's lost. Um, you know, on our, you know, on Judgment Day, will the unrepentant sinner be able to say, "Well, I didn't have the capacity"? No, you had the responsibility to do it. You're responsible for not having done it. So. You know, there is a subtlety there. Um, we don't deny human responsibility. You do have a responsibility to repent and believe, and you'll be held accountable on Judgment Day, and you won't be able to plead that you didn't, uh, uh, you didn't, uh, you weren't given the capacity to to do so. Because we are, at the simultaneously, we are both. Two things can be true at the same time. We are both unable and unwilling. We are lovers of the darkness rather than the light. Jesus says, "We love the darkness. We're in the darkness." Uh, we don't hate the darkness. We love the darkness. We want to stay in the darkness. Well, we hate it, the light. Um, so, we, no, we don't. We don't. Yeah, because our deeds are evil. Because that's, that's what's compatible with our nature. And unless we are transformed by regeneration, born again, we will, we will, be, um, we will be lost and, and, and cannot but be lost. So then there's one other deviation on this, and that is Amaro. Moses Amaro, a f- French Reformed theologian. Uh, uh, he taught at the school of S- in Samur, somewhere in France. He reordered the decrees in order to get a universal redemption. So w- what, uh, what he said, so the, uh, traditional Calvinism says that God decreed to create, then the fall, then elect, right? So we talked about how he chooses out of the fallen mass of humanity. So this is the infralapsarian scheme. And then to redeem, Amaro says, no, creation, fall, Redemption, so redemption is for the whole world, and, and then he elects some to believe. And you, get, you end up with a universal atonement, but again, you then have the problem. And B- Richard Baxter was an Amaraldian. You end up with an atonement that doesn't atone. No, not a universal. No, no, and all you have to do is read Baxter's treatise on conversion, and it's the most powerful pleading for sinners to repent I've ever seen sustained over like 300 pages. I mean, it's just extraordinary what, what he, uh, the, 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 every, every conceivable angle he is going after with, with hands and feet, going after the unbeliever to, to plead with them to believe. Um, because he's not a universalist. He believes people are going to hell, but he, ha- he, he understands a redemption to be universal. So redemption... Um, is prior to election. So everyone is taken up in redemption, but then some are elect and some are not, and the ones that are not elect, they've never come to faith and they're lost. Joe? Is election the same as consummation? Is that by creation, fall, redemption, consummation? No, election is God choosing. So to elect is to choose. Consummation refers to that which happens at the end when the kingdom of God is fully ushered in and history ends and God's kingdom is established. Um, so, anyway, we digress. Um, so, 20, what is, uh, how is it, how is what Christ accomplished at the cross applied to those born prior to the incarnation, to those born after? So, 
we are to read paragraph 6. Although the work of redemption was not actually wrought by Christ till after his incarnation, yet the virtue, efficacy, and benefits thereof were communicated unto the elect in all ages success, successively from the beginning of the world in and by those promises and types and sacrifices where, wherein he was revealed and signified to be the seed of the woman which had bruised the serpent's head. That's Genesis 3.16, the lamb of lamb slain from the beginning of the world, being yesterday, today, the same, and forever. In all ages successively, uh, in and by those promises, types, and sacrifices. So the benefits of Christ, redemption, were communicated to Abraham in Abraham's day, to Moses in Moses' day, to David in David's day. The benefits of that redemption were communicated through the promises, types, and sacrifices. The sacrifices themselves were not efficacious, but the benefits of Christ were communicated through the sacrifices. So the confession is arguing. And hence, Abraham went to heaven. And hence, who, the Mount Transfiguration, who shows up? Moses, Moses and Elijah, they're representing the, the law and the prophets. Um, they're, they're in heaven. But even there's evidence, like, in and Adam and Eve in their, in their conceiving of Cain are looking forward to the offspring, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they have a promise of offspring that is going to crush the serpent's head, and they're, they're looking forward to that from the beginning. Yeah, I think if you pay careful attention to the language in Genesis 4, uh, there's some anticipation that Cain is the Savior. Yeah. And they're wrong about that, but they're, looking Very forward, wrong. but they're looking forward to right. an option. But then comes Abel, and it's through Abel and then Seth and so forth, the godly line is established through whom the Messiah will come. But it, it's a long way off. Uh, paragraph, what were we to read? Eight. Paragraph 8. To all those whom Christ hath purchased, again, past tense, redemption, he doth certainly and effectually apply and communicate the same, making intercession for them, revealing unto them in and by the word. So you have his intercession. You have the word. Read, preached, sung, prayed, displayed in the sacraments. The mysteries of salvation, effectually persuading them by his spirit to believe and obey and governing their hearts by his word and spirit overcoming all their enemies by his almighty power and, and wisdom in such manner and ways as are most consonant in, uh, to his wonderful and unsearchable dispensations. Uh, so the, well, well, the, we, we've read all the paragraphs excepting so seven. Christ in the work of mediation acts according to both natures, by each nature doing that which is proper to itself, yet by reason of the unity of the person, that which is proper to one nature is sometimes in scripture attributed to the other person, uh, denominated by the other nature. So that, uh, the famous case of that is Acts 20, the, the blood of God. God doesn't have blood. So the argument is that sometimes just in informal uh, speech in the, in the New Testament, the, 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 what's true of the one nature will be attributed to the other, and that is known amongst the theologians as the communi communicate idiomatum. Okay, uh, so what are the questions that remain from all of this? Warfield. B.B. Warfield. It's in Savior of the World. The book Savior of the World, it might be in his collected works, I don't remember. Um, brilliant, brilliant sermon. Yeah. Earlier you mentioned the book of communication of, remember the name that was? Of communication of, Imitating the Incarnation, right. Um, 
Are you guys thinking I should, we should get out of here? Yeah. We're staying. Yeah, we're just kidding. We got a parking lot. Class dismissed.